Collective Insights is a voyage through topics and technologies revolutionizing human well-being. Groundbreaking approaches for a better world and a better life await you. Welcome to Collective Insights. Collective Insights and the work we do at Neurohacker Collective is made possible from the support of our community and the sales of our product, Qualia. Qualia is a comprehensive mental enhancement supplement designed to improve focus, mood, and flow state. Learn more about Qualia at neurohacker.com and use coupon code COLLECTIVEINSIGHTS20 for $20 off your first order. Welcome everyone to the Collective Insights podcast. My name is Daniel. I'm with Research and Development here at The Collective. And we are excited and delighted to have Dr. Molly Malouf, MD, with us today. Molly is um, a, a really brilliant doctor and innovator in health sciences and a good friend and lovely human being. And uh, she, after uh, graduating medical school, getting into medicine, has worked in San Francisco, Silicon Valley with a number of uh, tech companies innovating in the biotech space as an advisor and consultant to a number of them in, in areas of nutrigenomics and continuous glucose monitoring and other forms of uh, quantified self and biodata and um, personalized medicine. And so we're going to get to talk with her about a number of kind of cutting edge things in the personalized medicine, biohacking, uh, as well as future biotech space. And Molly, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, Daniel, for inviting me. So before we dive right into some of the areas that you're um, actively working on that are, I think, going to be fascinating to our listeners here, uh, I'd just like a, a short little bit on what got you into medicine um, and what got you into specifically integrative and personalized medicine and the tech side of it. Um, what's your kind of story into the space? Um, it goes pretty far back into my childhood and to about fifth grade when I decided that my calling was to become a doctor. And since then, I, you know, I guess I was reading books by Michael Crichton and like Chekhov and randomly reading Russian novels and just was really inspired by the physicians and the stories about doctors and wanted to help the world. And so I spent most of my life, um, committed to this path and, had a lot of people tell me not to do it, including the president of the Peoria Medical Association, <laughs> who told me to become a corporate lawyer instead. But um, I persisted and found my way into medicine and found my way into a system that was, um, you know, really a system that I understood was designed to treat and bill for disease. And it occurred to me in medical school that um, human health is actually really important and it's a science that we should be studying. But it wasn't really taught well in my medical school. So I designed a course for doctors, for medical students, um, called Physician Heal Thyself Evidence-Based Lifestyle. And it was really just all, all about the different facets of medicine um, that we weren't being taught. So we weren't being taught nutrition well. We were being taught calories in, calories out, you know, just really antiquated theories on, on nutrition. We were, being, um, we were not being taught about exercise. We were not being taught about sleep. People were not being taught about um, behavioral medicine. In fact, a lot of doctors would tell me, uh, no one pays for that, so we're not going to teach it. And that's really the sort of, that, that, what, that's really what hit me um, in med school that, you know, maybe the full on doctor job in a hospital would be my destiny. And I got into my residency and found myself really profoundly unhappy and decided to change the course of my career by uh, pursuing a career in personalized medicine and health technology. And from there, I um, have flourished in San Francisco. And, and, you know, if you want to learn more about me, I guess you can read about my LinkedIn. But I've done a lot of really crazy things in the last five years, a lot of jobs. So it's been a crazy, amazing adventure. So I heard you say kind of the foundations of health, which was sleep and better understanding of nutrition and behavioral medicine. And then I also heard you say personalized medicine, which is beyond everyone should get enough sleep. How do we make sure that we're really customizing to the person? Can you kind of talk a little bit about the relationship between foundations and personalized medicine? Sure. Um, I guess the framework that I would place this in is everyone kind of knows 
the guidelines of health. Like the government promotes certain guidelines that people do. People eat, people are supposed to eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. People are supposed to move 30 minutes a day. But knowing what we're supposed to do and knowing how to get there is profoundly unique and personalized in an individual because everyone has a different path to health. And what works for one person isn't going to work for everyone. And I think that's where the movement of of guidelines-based public health recommendations has has become more personalized medicine Um, because we're just realizing that just telling people what to do isn't working. We have to show them the unique path that they need to take to get to where they want to be. And I myself have been on this journey for many, many years of trying to figure out how do I achieve my goals and maintain really good health in the process. And um, I think that we're moving into an era where we're starting to have a data-driven approach to doing this rather than just, you know, traditional recommendations that our grandmother would have told us. We're learning that there are even more detailed, nuanced ways to go about optimizing our health. And that, that gets, I guess, gets into the discussion of things like wearable technology and continuous monitoring and, and laboratory testing genetics. Okay. So when you talk about a data-driven approach and obviously to personalized medicine, we can pay attention to just our subjective experience, but we can also track bio data. Um, mm-hmm. We've got both the kinds of data that you can go get from blood tests or other uh, medical tests. And there's obviously deeper functional medicine testing than what will often happen in a general you know, GP's mm-hmm. office. And then yeah. there's also the kind of at-home quantified self that can give us more continuous insights and insights under stress conditions. Maybe talk to us a little bit about the field of diagnostics and health assessment. Sure. Gosh, I could really go on for like days on this topic because one of my first jobs uh, before I became a doctor uh, was working in a medical hospital, in a hospital lab. And so I was doing phlebot. I was actually wandering around the hallways, drawing blood, learning about how to process the specimens, and then also running specimens to and from, you know, different departments in the laboratory. So I got a really different perspective on medicine before most people, um, most doctors just don't know how labs work. Like they know how to order them and they know what they mean, but they don't really understand the nuanced um, details of how they're gathered and how they're processed and how they're performed. And so I... I, I guess I just got I got a really um, good head start on all this, and and because of that, I've been just really fascinated by the field itself. Because you know, we used to be getting labs like once every few years from our doctors, and now we've got this chronic disease epidemic, so people are getting their labs like once a year. But what I learned a few years ago, working for a company called GeneSolve, that it no longer exists, but it was a really cool company. Um, that created personalized nutrition, personalized um, custom combat and nutraceuticals and hormones for people. Um, basically like bespoke medicine. It was really, really cool. And I learned that um, people's biology is changing pretty rapidly throughout the year and getting your blood labs drawn once a year, you know, it, I, I would argue isn't enough because you're changing so much. So uh, we were doing labs every quarter and then we were um, optimizing people's medicines every quarter so that their bodies would function like high performance race cars. And a lot of our, a lot of people that we worked with were executives. And so, you know, that was, that, and that was just blood labs and a few genetic SNPs. So that was like four years ago, maybe. And, um, and then, and, you know, I've been doing functional testing throughout all this things like micronutrient testing, like the NutraVal from Genova Diagnostics or the um, stool assessments from Doctors Data or GI effects from, from Genova or, um, you know, and then, and then there's like a bunch of other tests that you can do things like, you know, steroid hormone, biochemical pathways and immunology testing and antibody testing. And, and there's so much you can do to really get a picture of what's really happening in the person's body. But again, these tests are all done in, you know, they're, they're all one spot check that day that, that you've gotten them. And so that's where um, I got an interest in continuous monitoring because it, it occurred to me that since our bodies are constantly changing and shifting, we, there's probably some things things that we might want to look at in real time. And to me, those things have become, um, one second. Um, those things have become things like, uh, heart rate variability, heart rate variability testing and which I consider to be a diagnostic test. And then, um, 
And then continuous glucose monitoring, which to me is like the ultimate lifestyle biomarker because it just, you can see, you can see what's happening in your bloodstream in real time. It's awesome. So I know that uh, continuous glucose monitoring is an area that you have worked with a lot and worked with some of the companies that are innovating technologies for how to uh, assess uh, blood sugar in real time. And so I'm interested in diving in there. Something that we've talked about on this show and and other podcasts quite a lot is uh, defining health not as homeostatic state where the markers are relative to a reference frame in one moment, but defining it as homeostatic or homeodynamic capacity, the capacity Mm -hmm. for the body to regulate and stay within range and the ability to do it under a wider degree of stressors. So basically the adaptive capacity of the system. And so, you know, the concept of just running uh, a blood sugar panel where we look at glucose and insulin and A1C, obviously we just get a snapshot and without factoring the stressor, if we do a, uh, you know, glucose stress test, we get to see some response to uh, putting sugar in the body and seeing how it does, but we're not going to get to see how it does over a very long time mm-hmm. and how it does with low blood sugar and et cetera. So then continuous glucose monitoring gives us really the sense of how the body is regulating one of the core, you know, homeodynamic axes. So to talk right. to us a little bit, like most people think about this as something for type one diabetics. Sure. Um, what is this as a health metric and a, a you know bio optimization metric? Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I'll, I'll, let me take you back to a few years ago when I did a talk for the Quantified Self Meetup, and I was doing some consulting for a company that was asking me to dig into all the different biomarkers you could measure in interstitial fluid, and that's the fluid that's not in your bloodstream. That's the fluid that's in your tissue, like outside of your bloodstream, the sort of crystalline matrix, right? And that tissue has lots of biomarkers. But to me, I was looking at, okay, what are the biggest problems in society in terms of health? And to me, it, it just be, it was very obvious that diabetes was going to become an even worse problem. And it has in the last four years, it's gotten worse and worse. So I said, look, you guys need to look at glucose. So I started wearing the Dexcom and I found, wow, like here I am trying to promote optimal health. Here I am working with patients and I'm letting my blood sugar drop way too low. I'm getting hangry. My relationships are being affected. I'm not maintaining regular blood sugar in, in a, in a healthy way. And so, um, that was a big eye opening experience for me. And so I really, I really started caring about it at that moment when I realized that like, wow, even I can benefit from this. And And one of the things that I was listening. Yeah. I'm guessing that when you were noticing that you already were on a relatively good diet. Yeah, I mean, I was eating a fairly healthy diet, I guess. I was eating healthier than most people would, would be eating. I wasn't eating right. um, fast food or junk food. I mean, it was really about, for me, it was really about meal timing and maintaining consistent blood sugars and not letting myself get low. And um, I was surprised at how uh, how I wasn't I, mean, I wasn't doing a good job at that. And one of the things that we're learning now about hypoglycemia is that for people, People who have who have autoimmune disease, it's actually really important to maintain regular meal times because when you drop too low, it actually activates IL six and causes inflammation to arise, and that's not healthy for anybody. So, so, so too low blood sugar is one way you can optimize your health. You can also use glucose monitoring for hunger tra- training. So you can. Um, a lot of people are totally out of touch with their hunger biosignal, and we need to know when we need fuel and we need to know when we don't need fuel. And people are just eating all the time. And that's not great, right? Because now we're, now we're never really getting into autophagy. We're never really getting in, we're never, we're never really taking the garbage out of our cells. And everyone is, um, is kind of like overnourished, right? And so hunger training is cool because you can use the blood sugar numbers to say, okay, I'm going to only eat when I get below 85 milligrams per deciliter. And there's actually papers on this, but biofed, biofeedback papers on uh, obese and overweight people who have not felt the feeling of hunger hunger in a long time. And they're finding it's just one really simple tool you can use to identify when you need to eat. So, um, so regular meal timing is key. Eating when you are actually hungry is key. (laughs) These are all basic little things, right? We should all know, but we don't do. And part of the reason why we don't do it is because there's food in our face all the time in modern society. Um, the other, other markers that I I look at are, I'm looking at the, the fasting glucose. So 
Fasting glucose, right now, the government says, as long as you're below 100, you're good to go. But there's actually evidence that shows that above 90, you start increasing your risk of diabetes significantly. So I, I actually want to see people below 89. That's my personal preference. Um, I don't see everybody there. And so that's, an, that's a room for improvement. Um, the, uh, the other thing that people don't realize is that postprandial blood sugars, most people aren't even looking at them. So doctors are diagnosing prediabetes and diabetes with hemoglobin A1C, which is your average glucose over the last few months, and they're diagnosing it with your fasting glucose, but they're not looking at your body's response to food, and that's also a way to diagnose prediabetes or diabetes. And so if you're not looking at that, that's problematic. And these glucose tolerance tests are really good tests, but they're really painful to do because you have to be at a hospital or a clinic for like two hours. So having a glucose test you can do at home to actually see in real time how your body's responding to food is absolutely phenomenal. And that's where my big, my, a lot of my research is going into right now. I'm literally reading like hundreds of papers on postprandial blood sugar, because I actually think that the standards we have for people are again, too high and that we should all be looking at, um, we should all be trying to aim for blood sugars probably below 120 because most healthy people are below 120, um, after meals. And that's, And by the way, I wasn't a year ago. And that was pretty profoundly interesting too, is realizing like, shoot, I have even more to work on. And so the last year, I've dramatically dropped my um, blood sugar from like 5.6 to about 4.7. And, you know, we can get into the theories behind how, what's the best way to go about this. But um, there's just, there's really a lot that you can do for your health using this one biomarker. I mean, I didn't even talk about stress. I mean, stress changes the variability of your blood sugar as well as inducing insulin resistance. So there's quite a lot to be discussed here. Okay. So you, you actually brought up about eight things that I want to ask you more about. <laughs> so um, first one is if we're doing continuous glucose monitoring and we're seeing that uh, blood sugar is or isn't dropping below certain metrics and going up above certain metrics, mm-hmm. how, how well does that correspond just the blood glucose to uh, checking fasting insulin, hemoglobin A1C, glycomark, other measures that we would normally use to be able to test long-term uh, blood sugar health in a snapshot. Right. Yeah. So my big personal belief is that if you really care about your blood sugar and, and really care about this homeostatic capacity, you're going to want to do a lot more labs than just one marker. So you're, you're not going to just want to do continuous glucose monitoring. You're, you're going to want to see your fructose. I mean, you're going to want to see your glycated albumin. You're going to want to see your homo IR. And, and also, like, I just read a book on the oral glucose tolerance test. And really, we should all be getting a two-hour glucose tolerance test with insulin. So we should be measuring our blood glucose over the course of two hours mm-hmm. at one hour and two hours with, with insulin as well. And going into that test completely fasting. Because a lot of people are going to show um, insulin resistance before they even show blood sugar dys- dysregulation. Mm-hmm. So the only way to really tell if you have insulin resistance, you can check fasting insulin, but that's only going to tell you about your hepatic insulin sensitivity. It's not going to tell you about your muscle insulin sensitivity. And that's what a lot of people don't understand is that insulin sensitivity is tissue dependent, right? So there's different, so you can have abnormal fasting glucose and normal muscle insulin sensitivity and normal postprandial glucose. I'm probably getting way too into like the biomarkers here, but what I'm trying to say is that you, you, to be able to really look at what's happening inside your body, you're going to need more than one marker. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason why, I mean, hemoglobin A1C isn't um, a perfect test because if you have anemia or you have um, too much ferritin or too much iron in your, in your body, you're going to have abnormal, abnormal numbers. And most people don't realize that. So it's key to see this all in context. Um, and then also really looking at a person's lifestyle and not just focusing on food, but also looking at what their sleep is like and what their exercise is size of like and what the what their stress levels are like. So I want to go to the topic that you were mentioning earlier, the difference between the current normal ranges and the actual physiologic ranges that we're identifying correspond to optimized health. And yeah. so you're mentioning, you know, blood sugar of a hundred, not that great. Um, so for people who are not overweight and who don't um, think that they are candidates for type two diabetes, should they care about this topic at all? Oh my God. Yes. Because everybody is at risk to these days. I mean, the number of people who are developing diabetes and prediabetes is astonishing. 
And the, if, if I can have issues in my blood sugar, anyone can, because I was eating incredibly healthy diet with no fake sugar, no, no, no white sugar. I was, I was the only sugar in my diet a year ago was dried fruit, maple syrup and honey. And I still had blood sugar issues. So it's far more complicated than, than eating like a normal diet. I, I think there's, there's a lot to, I mean, people need to think about pollution, which can affect blood sugar, um, vitamin D levels, hormone levels, oxidative stress, issues with methylation. Um, I mean, all these things affect your blood sugar. So I think that because it's such a big epidemic and because it's becoming worse by the year, and because I see healthy looking people who have healthy diets, who are skinny, have insulin resistance, I, I think it's important for everyone to look at it. So would you explain, because not all the listeners are going to know what this is, what is insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome and sure. very early prediabetes? Right. So metabolic syndrome is a cluster of conditions that we bind, like we bind together. And if you have enough of them, you get diagnosed with metabolic syndrome. So it's things like hypertension, um, tri high, high triglycerides, high waist circumference, and if you have like three out of five of the, um, and I believe it's high, low HDL, um, high triglycerides. So if you have three or five of these, you get the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. And the re reason why they, that matters is because metabolic syndrome puts you at great risk for diabetes and heart disease. So it's, that's because these are metabolic diseases. Now, um, prediabetes is this, is not actually like a clinical diagnosis in, the, in a frank sense. And is that, in as much as it's a, specific range of blood sugar that doctors care about because you're highly likely to end up with diabetes and the conversion rates in are you know they're, they're, i've been trying to like hone in on these because i'm writing a paper for the fda right now all about why people should care about this stuff and the the, the point is, is that a large percentage of people are going to convert within 10 years um and like something like 10% a year will end up with when will end up developing diabetes. So the reason why we care about prediabetes is really because we want to we want to start aggressively targeting people who are going to get diabetes. Now here's the thing, here's the reason why all this really matters. When you're pre-diabetic, you've already lost 30% of your beta cell function. And your beta cells produce insulin, and insulin allows you to take glucose into your cells. By the time you're diabetic, you've already lost 50% of your beta cell function, which means your body's not, you're, you're basically like a half of a type one diabetic. Like no one thinks about it this way, but that's really what's happening in your body. And, um, and insulin resistance develops when we have consistently too high of insulin levels because our body's pumping out extra insulin because it's trying to put the glucose away into our cells and use it as fuel, but it can't because our cells are becoming resistant to the insulin. And um, there's a few ways that you can develop insulin resistance. And, and this is something that I can go on um, because there's really two two schools of thought around how to treat this disease uh, nutritionally, and I have some like pretty astonishing things that I found that I'd love to tell you about. Yeah, so I would love to hear the two schools of thought and the astonishing things you found. And um, you mentioned you started to mention micronutrient deficiency. You mentioned vitamin mm -hmm. D, but you know also we could talk about chromium and vanadium sure. and zinc. And so because the traditional school of thought that most people are familiar with is eat lower glycemic index food, mm -hmm. get your macros right and exercise and you're fine. Mm -hmm. and so I'm curious for you to say why that's not the whole picture. Right. Well, because the microbiome, <laughs> because if you um, eat a diet that just allows you to get the macronutrients you need, but doesn't have large quantities of fiber or phytonutrients that are filled with, you know, like when you eat plant material, you're getting all these minerals and vitamins and cofactors and all these things that your body needs. And when you're eating healthy forms of protein, and healthy forms of fat, you're getting all these signals in your body that are sensing, your cells are sensing, okay, I can function optimally. And if you're deficient in anything, it just throws off these metabolic cycles. So a lot of people are eating nutritionally deficient, what I call dead food which is packaged processed American crap that's highly refined and very nutrient, very nutrient poor. And they're not nourished. They're, they're, they've got calories and they've got, you know, so, like they've got carbohydrates, but they don't have the right, they don't have ones that are bound to fiber or bound to what they call right. Heavy water, the, the water that's bound in these cells of plants that is so good for our bodies. Um, and they're not bound, you know, they're not with, they, they don't come with all these wonderful 
pigments from plants that are helpful for combating oxidative stress. And diabetes is a, de- is a disease of inflammation and oxidative stress. So if you eat a diet that doesn't have these anti-inflammatory and antioxidant subst- like, you know, um, substances, you're going to have problems. Um, this is my big argument against things like soylent and against like just drinking our food through, um, you know, man-made manufactured shakes. I just don't think that that's living food. Okay. So you said something that's really key is earlier you said we're, um, overfed or, you know, we have excessive nutrition and then here you're talking about, uh, deficient nutrition and they're happening at the same time, right? Which is too many calories and macros and not enough micronutrients. And right. I think if I was going to give any, if I was going to give people any diet advice, this would be pretty close to the top is increase your micronutrients and decrease your macros. Obviously, we need to get the right ratio of macros and the right types of fatty acids and amino acids. But in general, when we look at caloric restriction, we see that people with less calories live longer, but it's not. Well, less let's, talk about, let's talk about decreasing macros for a second, because okay. I'm going to blow your mind. I have been talking to all these groups of people who are trying to combat diabetes with different nutritional prescriptions. And on one end, we've got this guy in San Diego, Cyrus, uh, of Mango Man Nutrition. And on the other end, we've got Verta Health. Verta Health is the ketogenic diet company in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And both groups are seeing, and by the way, I have all, you can actually see, um, I got the, the, uh, the results of Cyrus's um, cohort from him directly. And then I got Verta Health's results off of their website. And both groups are seeing the same amount of drop of hemoglobin A1C and the same amount of drop of weight. And they're completely different macronutrient recommendations. One end of the spectrum is ni- is like 90% of, car- like less than 10% of, gra- um, less than 10% of calories from fat. And the other one is less than 10% of calories from carbs. And both of them have fairly consistent protein amounts. Although I'd say that the, the, the mango man guy, he's probably got a little bit less protein because he's fully plant-based. But we're seeing that people moving into a whole food diet, rather, it, they're, they're getting similar results. And now I, what I'm really curious about with both these companies is I want to talk to the people who failed. Because I mm-hmm. want to figure out what happens if we put them on the other end. You know? Like, what happens if we bring them to the other side? Like, are they going to have a better response? Like, to me, that's going to be the future of personalized nutrition is, you know, we, we give you a diet and maybe it's not that extreme. Maybe we don't need to go to this massive extreme to get people to better health. But, um, you know, what happens when, when we have this ability to actually prescribe the perfect amount of macronutrients and the right amount of whole foods so that a person's body just reverts, like just reverts back to normal because it's what the body needs to be eating. Well, so this is the interesting thing when we talk about making sure that we're not in excessive macros, meaning that we're not consuming just way too many calories a day. And of course, then calories from shitty sources and enough micros is that if you look at an evolutionary environment that didn't have a bunch of refined starch and sugars, like all the stuff that you would have been able to gather pre-agriculture was going to have a lot of vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and not a whole lot of macro concentration. And so, I mean, from an evolutionary sense, if you're just eating things that look like right. they came out of a living ecosystem, you're going to be much closer. And it also makes sense that the macro ratio would change throughout the course of the year and even just change with whether hunting went well or you're mostly depending on gathering. Absolutely. And so there's I something think a lot kind of, of aren't thinking about that at all, right? And, and also just like where you're located in the, wor- in the world. Yeah. Right? People who live by the equ- equator eat more carbs. People, they also tend to be outside moving around more. People who live more towards Arctic places, they don't have the ability to go hunt and fish that often. So they're eating slower burning, high fat diets. And this is where my sort of mini theory that I, I just, it's not even a theory. It's more of like a metaphor for nutrition where like certain people are going to thrive on, on kindling and certain people are going to thrive on candles. And Mm -hmm. it's like candles are slow burning fuel and kindling is very quick. And you typically see these people who are, who are, Eating large, I mean, I know people who eat carbs all day long and they're just fine. Their blood sugar is just fine because their metabolism is, 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 is basically working just fine, being, being um, stoked lightly with, with kindling. And on the other end, you see people who are burning very slowly. They're eating high fat and, it's, and, and they're like, I don't, I'm never hungry. I don't have to eat very much. 
And, and you know what, like what I really hate about the nutrition field is just how antagonistic everyone is against everyone. And everyone's just trying to pretend like everyone's right. Like the vegans hate the keto people and the keto people think the vegans are nuts. And I'm just like, everyone needs to stop, take a step back and just think about biology. (laughs) Well, so now there's a couple interesting things. One thing is someone can get good results for a short term and then bad results longer term because they either are adapting to whatever this thing is and or they're getting some nutrient deficiencies or excesses that start to pool after a while. So it's right. pretty common that people, you know, you have two studies and both people are going to get better for a while, but then we have to really track longer term effects. Yes. Is- and this is where tracking and tracking matters. Yeah. And this is why I believe in micronutrient testing because there's so many people who don't realize just how much, oh, sorry. Um, (laughs) There's so many, sorry, my phone just rang. There's so many people who don't realize how screwed up our, uh, uh, our soil has become because of constant farming and over farming and topsoil depletion. So we don't have the nutrient density that we used to have from, from vegetables. And um, there's a really great book called The Intelligent Gardener. Mm-hmm. And it's literally just a book about how you should test your garden that you're growing plant. You're, let's say you're growing vegetables in your back garden. The entire premise of the book is that you should really just measure the minerals in the soil and, re- and replete with whatever is missing if you want to grow nutrient-dense food. Yeah. And my argument is that the same thing can be applied to a human being. We should be measuring our minerals and our vitamins and our nutrients in our body to see what we're missing, what we need to add. And it's like, to me, this is just first principles, but yet the government won't pay for this because optimizing health just isn't something people want to do because you, it's, it's like, I don't know why. I mean, it's because it's not, you're not getting paid for it, I guess, but disease is what we pay for. We don't pay for making people healthier and that, that needs to shift. And that's what I want to see change in the, in the country. You know, I appreciate that you brought up soil conditions. I got into uh, studying health and wellness as a kid because uh, some of my family members were diagnosed with incurable illnesses. And so we got on that journey. And one of the first uh, books that I read was uh, Empty Harvest by Dr. Bernard Jensen, where mm. he was, you know, and then Weston Price's stuff all about soil nutrients and that right. conventional agriculture's depletion of soil nutrients started statistically tracking to the types of disease in an area and mm-hmm. that where the, the selenium was gone from the soil, heart disease went up, where the chromium and vanadium were gone, diabetes went up. And it was... Oh my God, so true. And you know, th- th- this is one of those things where even if someone is eating fruits and vegetables, but they're eating them from poor sources, deficient in trace minerals, deficient in microbiome is going to be so a part of that whole picture. Yeah. And I think the thing you brought up around selenium is really fascinating. Um, the North Corellia project in... Finland that was done in the nineties. Um, what one of the, one of the main aspects of the program was remineral, re, remineralization of the soil with selenium mm-hmm. and along with changing people's dietary preferences through innovation diffusion theory and, um, subsidizing berry production in the country and trying to get people off of high fat dairy and, and reducing their red meat consumption. Um, the selenium, you know, remineral, re, remineralization probably play, played a pretty big role. But it was a you know multimodal approach. It's not like mm-hmm. you can just t- fix someone's selenium level and everything's going to get better in their body, right? So, so you use micronutrient testing as one of the bases. Obviously, you just foundationally say, are people eating enough uh, plants? And yes. but then you do, and is their microbiome good, and are they digesting and absorbing their nutrients? Right. But then you do micronutrient testing. And again, when you're looking at people who don't have diagnosed diseases, how often are you seeing micronutrient ranges that are not in physiologic optimum? Um, I see most people are most, I guess the way I would describe it is most people have some subclinical deficiency. Um, Almost everybody is low in magnesium. Almost everyone is low in vitamin D. Those are, those are often frank deficiencies. Um, Most people need probiotics, um, believe it or not. And then the, the, the B vitamins tend to reflect fairly well with a person's methylation patterns. Um, and then there's things like vitamin A and fat soluble vitamins. Like for example, I, I have some vitamin A, um, genetic issues. So I need a bit more vitamin A than the average person does. 
And, um, and so those things you can, you can look at genetics as well as you can look at your micronutrients, but I'd say, I'd say most people have pretty consistent, um, subclinical deficiencies of vitamins and minerals. Now, the funny thing is, is that I, I, I once took care of this guy who was a bodybuilder and he ate a pretty like typical bodybuilder diet. And he was one of the only people that I've ever seen. He had a lot of meat, by the way. He's one of the only people I'd ever seen who had like zero nutritional deficiencies, like zero, but his gut was super inflamed. So it was really fascinating because he had all his gut inflammation. Um, but yet I'm pretty sure like people don't realize that meat actually has quite a lot of nutrition in it. Um, so he actually had pretty great, um, micronutrient levels, but his, his gut, he didn't have enough fiber in his gut. And so Mm -hmm. we got him eating a lot more vegetables too. Because that's really the key. If you're going to be a meat eater, you have to eat vegetables with it because it really just makes a huge difference in the health of your microbiome. On the, as a bodybuilder, if he was eating four or 5,000 calories a day, um, that then too. a total quantity of intake. Um, yeah, that was, an, that was probably an issue as well. I don't think he was eating that much per day though, but. Yeah. So, okay. The reason that continuous glucose monitoring then becomes so interesting is because someone can be on a paleo diet or a keto diet or a zone diet or a vegan diet and think that it's appropriate for them and it's not, but how would they know? And so whether you're actually doing well on the diet you're on or not, this is going to be one of the better ways to tell. Exactly. I mean, I, I just got off of a ketogenic diet and I did it as a challenge with one of my friends, Britt Moran from the company Britt & Co. And... I was like, okay, this will be fun. Cause I did it last time I did it was a year ago and I felt like garbage, but I lost a ton of weight right before my sister's wedding. So I mm-hmm. looked great in the dress, but like came right back on afterwards. So I was like, okay, let's see if I do this right. Um, if I like take the right supplements and I, and I really optimize my nutrition and I track everything even more deeply. Like, let's see if I can g- get through this. And I ended up staying on it for about a month. Cause that's generally where I think you start seeing like some actual fat adaptation. And um, I have to admit, like, first two weeks were not that bad. First few days were not that great. But I, by the end of the month, was like, this is just heading towards orthorexic territory, where I'm literally freaking out about everything I'm eating. Like, does it have enough? Does it have too many carbs? Like, it's not a sustainable lifestyle for most people. And I just, I know that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check. I actually bought the cardio check, and I have it sitting here. And I'm going to check my, my blood lipids tomorrow morning and find out how high they've gotten because I have an APOE4 gene and I know that you're not supposed to eat super high fat with that gene, specifically, specifically high saturated fat. Mm-hmm. And no matter what I did, no matter how many monounsaturated fats I tried to consume, I still found myself leaning back on saturated fats during that diet. And it's just too hard to do if you can't eat a lot of saturated fat. It's just too hard. Mm-hmm. So, you know, obviously we've, heard a lot of people do brilliantly on the keto diet and a lot of people have a miserable time and it might be that they're getting it right or not getting it right, but it also might be appropriateness for their body. And as you mentioned, something like APOE4 is going to make a pretty big difference as to uh, how high you want your blood lipids to get of certain mm-hmm. types. Totally. Um, so I'm, I'm curious when you started getting your blood sugar closer in range with continuous glucose monitoring, what change yeah. that you could subjectively notice? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, the big thing was tiredness after meals. Um, when I would have a blood sugar spike and drop, I would just get profoundly tired. And it was the kind of tired where I was just really upset that I couldn't focus. And I really couldn't like get great work done because all I wanted to do was sit down and chill out. And so when you, when you get your blood sugar so stable that you're not having these peaks and drops anymore, you find yourself with like far more mental capacity to do things you want to do. And that means like, you're not losing hours of your day that you used to lose because you're tired after meals. So the big one was just not being tired after meals. Um, Mm -hmm. The other things that I've noticed, so I guess AD, ADD and ADHD symptoms dramatically improved. Um, and then um, what else improved? I mean, mental mental function and ADHD are the big ones for me. But um, and so, so energy consistency is big. And then um, the other things, I mean, like I, I have a pretty consistent weight. Um, so for me, like 
it wasn't really uh, a weight loss thing for me, but some people who do get their blood sugar normalized do find their weight improved. Uh, another thing that really improved is my skin. Mm-hmm. Now people don't realize this, but man, uh, um, acne and blood sugar are so intertwined because your blood sugar and your hormones are so intertwined. Mm-hmm. So when I got my blood sugar b- back to normal, I used to get these hormonal breakouts and they're basically gone. And they mm-hmm. really only come back when my blood sugar goes crazy or my stress is super, super out of control. And even then, like, what's funny is that like, I had some pretty significant stress over the last few months, but um, as long as my blood sugar was control under control, my, my skin was actually pretty great. And people always comment about my skin. So I'd say that like just the, the general quality of, of my skin, and basically it looks a lot younger. Like I used to have some wrinkles around my eyes and I actually think that, um, and I, I really think it's the, the blood sugar normalization that that's made a huge difference in that. So beyond the effect on hormones, which would be significant, talk about advanced glycation in products. It, it sure, seems yeah. like you have an automatic uh, life extension yep. effect of getting that dialed in. Now, people don't quite think, okay, what really drives me nuts about advanced glycation end products is like, there are literally companies in the Bay Area that are developing drugs to like fight AGEs. And this to me is just the dumbest thing in the world because why do you need to take drugs when all you have to do is stop eating so much, so many refined carbohydrates? <laughs> or, and the other thing people don't talk about is, um, you know, the most amazing, delicious Maillard reaction in food the crispy outside of any fried carbohydrate that you consume, that's actually pretty carcinogenic and a great source of AGEs. Mm-hmm. So it's a great source of acryl- acrylamide and AGEs. And like, I did eat fried potatoes for the first time in like, God knows, maybe six months yesterday in Chicago because the chef literally heated up fresh oil for me because he knew I was celiac. <laughs> so I wasn't going to be like, no. But um, I rarely eat fried food for this reason because it's such an aging, it's, it's, it's such, the most aging food you can eat is fried carbohydrate. It's period. Um, and maybe fried meat because fried meat also has the same problems, but, um, yeah, I just really try to avoid fried food in general because I don't want those AGEs to get into my body and to, to age my skin. And that's part of the reason why like, I, like a lot of people don't realize like baked goods, all those brown, beautiful croissants, that's just all, you know, that, that's just like, it's, it's really not good for your body at the end of the day. It tastes so delicious. It's so tantalizing, but it's just, it's bad, you know? And the real, realization is, is like, I do, I do really do miss eating these things. Like mm. there's not a day that goes by where I'm like, man, I like, I would love to eat a chocolate croissant, but I'd also really like to live and feel amazing as I age. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, I haven't been, I haven't been granted the genetics to live off of processed standard American food. I just haven't. That's just not, that's not me. So I have to be vigilant. And for me, um, it means avoiding these things that I know give me subjective um, and objective measures of inflammation that I can feel and I can see out labs. So other than diabetes, how does instability in blood sugar and the blood sugar related markers relate to longevity and other disease processes you're talking about systemic sure. inflammation and I oh god yes okay so like most people don't most people like you and I we, we get this but a lot of people aren't aware that diabetes it is go, heart disease is hand in hand with diabetes and the vast majority of, of heart disease can be prevented through reducing sugar intake and reducing pre-diabetes and diabetes um, because you're actually there's there's evidence that shows that postprandial blood sugar is a is a greater risk factor for heart disease, high high postprandial blood sugar spikes and drops, is a bigger risk factor for heart disease than high fasting blood sugar because of the effect of, the oxidative stress effect that this has on your blood vessels. And the fact that blood sugar sitting around not getting used by your tissues is damaging the internal lining of your blood vessels. And so it damages the lining of all your blood vessels, not just your heart, not just the macrovasculature, but the microvasculature, the, the vasculature in your eyes, in your kidneys, in your fingers, and your toes, um, all of these gets damaged. And the problem with that is that you end up, by the time you have diabetes, you already have, you already have damage in all these areas. So you're already basically set up to eventually lose your limbs, lose your kidney function, lose your vision. And a large quantity of people's macular degeneration can be prevented through blood sugar control. So 
that's not, and I haven't even talked about cancer where cancer basically lives on glucose. Mm -hmm. And if you don't make sure your glucose is under control, you're setting yourself up for butcher for, for cancer as well. So these are all going to kill you eventually. I mean, basically infection will kill you eventually too. So, um, if you end up getting infection, what does infection live off of? It, it, it lives off of glucose. Bacteria eat glucose, right? So, so if you have bacteria in your bloodstream and you've got a lot of blood sugar in your blood, bloodstream, you've got a perfect storm. I think that this isn't a topic that everybody knows, but since cancer cells are reproducing at a faster rate than normal healthy cells, they can't actually convert energy from fats and proteins. So they mm -hmm. need to take energy from sugar, which both can mean increasing cravings for sugar and that unstable blood sugar leads to faster carcinogenesis of many kinds. Right. Um, the work on insulin potentiated chemo, I found very interesting um, where do uh, almost no carbohydrate diet for some period of time. Cancer cells are starving. The other cells are converting to process energy from protein and fat more effectively. And then uh, they do a low dose of a chemotherapeutic agent with a lot of sugar. So that basically the cancer cells are uptaking the sugar and uptaking the lace chemotherapeutic agent. And so you get much less toxic effect on the overall body while having more wow. anti-carcinogenic effect. And that is brilliant. Just seeing that insulin potentiated chemo makes chemo so much more effective gives you a little bit of sense of how big a deal blood sugar would be in, in carcinogenesis. Yes. And Daniel, when I was in the hospital working in a pediatric cancer ward, one of the largest pediatric cancer wards in Northern California, feeding them sugar. I, all I saw was these kids eating Oreos and cake and candy. And I would complain to my professors and my attendings. I said, look, this is violating first principles. Yeah. And they would look at me like I was crazy. And I'm just like, I, I honestly, like I, I couldn't handle it. Like I had patients dying and I just felt like, I felt really, really unhappy watching the system just like be so antiquated, be so ignorant of what is so basic to biology. You know, it's just heartbreaking is what it is. So for listeners that have, heard me talk about this before it's going to sound like i'm harping on it but if you're listening to this podcast i just want to kind of reiterate that uh research has to get paid for by somebody and so within capitalism science has this issue of who's paying for the research and if that's money out does the money come back so is there return on investment and if there's return on investment you're going to get more research dollars and if it's Going, if a doctor is going to recommend something, it has to be FDA approved for that disease, which means you've got to go through clinical trials for FDA approval, which if we're looking at a drug is going to cost half a billion to a billion dollars, which means that if you don't have a patent on it, there's no way you could ever recoup that money. So you're only going to look at synthetic molecules that you can get a patent on. So anything that the body naturally produces as part of its healing can't be patented we're just not going to do that much research on it. Any nutrient, any plant from an evolutionary environment, any microbes from the evolutionary environment, mm -hmm. the, the intersection of the financial motives and the financial structure with the IP structure, with the regulatory structure means that the things that where you would expect the answers to live just will never get the funding for research. And the only thing that will is going to be, you know, synthetic chemicals that weren't part of the evolutionary health environment at all. So this isn't really the fault of the pharma companies or regulation. It's the fault of like the whole complex is just built wrong. And it's built in a way that makes managing symptoms much more profitable than preventing or curing illness. You and know what though? I mean, not to interrupt you, but I have to say that like things do seem to be, doctors are starting to wake up a little bit. There are pockets of doctors that are studying this stuff. And there are people that are bundling these metabolic therapies with chemotherapies and the, and I've, I've talked to VCs, and they're actually starting to become interested in, in investing in these multimodal approaches to optimizing health. And, and really because the precision medicine movement is actually taking foot, that I see this as possible. And because, of, because of you know, bundled payments and this new way of paying for disease, um, there is money to be made in these new types of therapies. But it, it's really the, we're in this early, early, early stage of that happening. And with people paying out of pocket who are interested right. in health because of, you know, conversations like these, right. you have people who will go do micronutrient testing that insurance won't cover. 
Um, and so there starts to become an actual market basis for it. Right. If you're interested in actually getting into this um, a little bit more, my friend has a podcast called P5 Protocols, and he's talking to doctors who are on the forefront of these new types of cancer therapies, mm-hmm. these metabolic therapies for cancer, and and really like the way that they're trying to combine them into actual companies. And so they're, they're, that's a great podcast if you really feel like digging into like cancer metabolism. Um, he, he's been covering a few people who are doing that. Say the name of the podcast again. P5 Protocols. David right. Eigen. Awesome. Yeah. So going back to continuous glucose monitoring and then how it starts to relate to the other thing I wanted to ask you about, which is heart rate variability, um, as, a, mm-hmm. as a tie-in between them, what's the relationship between blood sugar and stress? Yes. Yeah, so I have just been, like I said, reading a bunch of papers on, on this really under-recognized problem and phenomenon. But, okay, so your body, so stress is this, the, the, one of the definitions of stress is the consequence of a failure of an organism to respond appropriately to emotional or physical threats, whether actual or imagined. And we all know, we've all heard it before, the story of how we're not living in primitive times. We don't have saber-toothed tigers. Our problems are mostly psychological. Our problems are mostly relational. Um, we don't we don't have enough people doing what they what is actually fundamental to managing stress to keep them in a state of um, a sense of safety internally. So most people are operating as though there's danger everywhere all the time, every day. Um, one of the worst sources of stress for people in America is unemployment um, or low, socioeconom- low socioeconomic status. And mm-hmm. it's not surprising that a lot of people with diabetes are in this demographic um, because when you have to worry about where your next meal is coming from, that's as, that's as close as you can get to the primitive experience of of not having food to eat. Um, so that's, that's one, that's one problem. Um, so when you have, when you have this constant sense of fear, um, it, it adds up over time. And what, and what initially, like you can get acute stress, which is like this epinephrine or epinephrine experience of like, get me out of a dangerous situation. But then over time, this becomes chronic. If you consistently have no way of resolving these stressful experiences. And one of the best ways to resolve stress is exercise because the fundamental reason why we have these stress responses is to get us to move and nobody's moving. (laughs) Our culture is not moving enough. We are not literally moving the stress out of our bodies. Um, And so exercise is like the fundamental antidote for stress and people aren't doing that. Um, So we're developing all these symptoms, right? These cognitive symptoms, these emotional symptoms, moodiness, poor judgment, physical symptoms, diarrhea, constipation, nausea, because we're not really digesting the food we're eating because we're so stressed out. And then all these behavioral systems add up and people end up isolating themselves, which further compounds the problem. And next thing you know, your cortisol curve went from high cortisol to low. Now you're flatlined and now your variability is gone. And that variability is actually the key to homeostatic balance is the ability for our bodies to adapt to whatever we face. And so this is where high rate variability and cortisol are great measures of stress in real time and over the course of a few months. Um, because they tell us if our bodies has the variability that we want to see that is telling us that we are fit to respond. If we, are, if we have flatlined cortisol curves, if we have low heart rate variability, we're not adapting to stress. In fact, we're, we're breaking down. Our, our bodies are breaking down. And the problem is that chronic cortisol excess increases insulin um, resistance just by nature of the, of the fact there's too much cortisol around. And by that, and so, so people, are, people are getting insulin resistant from just um, being too stressed out. And another big source of cortisol excess is sleep, um, sleep derangements. So it's not surprising that people who are in low socioeconomic status who have to, live, have to do things like shift work have really big problems in this area. And we see shift, shift workers have terrible metabolic disturbances. Even people working in hospitals have terrible metabolic disturbances. You see a lot of obesity and overweight in hospital employees because these people have to work during times when they should be sleeping and their cortisol levels are all haywire. Um, so I hope that does a decent job of explaining why this, why this, why there's a relationship here. Yeah. And when people are not sleeping well and they're tired and they crave sugar as a way of trying to get yes. some energy spike. Absolutely. We've seen sleep issues correlated with weight so clearly and with diabetes and insulin resistance. 
Mm-hmm. So you're talking about heart rate variability and talking about cortisol. And so I'd like to talk about the relationship between them. But for people who aren't familiar, what is heart rate variability? How do we assess it? What does it tell us? Sure. So heart rate variability is this, the way I describe it, is the beat-to-beat variation um, in terms of like the length of time in between heartbeats. So when your heartbeat is low, your body's constantly adjusting that time frame to whatever you're doing. Right. So whether you breathe deep, if you breathe really nice and deep, deeply, you can actually lengthen the amount of time between beats. If you are breathing really fast and you're stressed out, your heart rate's going to go up and that variability is going to go down because your body, your heart rate's just beating so fast. So one of the funny things that I've experienced in my own health is like over the course of the last two years um, and getting off of stimulant medicine that I started when I was in medical school. Um, my heart rate has gone from 70s to 50s. So there is evidence that shows that people who have lower heart rates have much better longevity. Um, it's it's part of this 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 whole big picture around VO2 max and, and heart um, sort of your your heart health in general. But fundamentally, like a healthy heart is a heart with that, that's able to respond when necessary and that isn't constantly in a state of terror. <laughs> mm-hmm. So a way that I think about heart rate variability is that, and this is an indirect measure, but it's a highly correlated indirect measure, is that it gives us the ratio of sympathetic to parasympathetic um, activity kind of writ large. So it's a measure of stress or sympathetic overtone comprehensively. Right, absolutely. And And you can see this. You can see this when you measure it. Mm -hmm. Like um, this company, First Beat. I used to use their, their, their test. Um, it's like a three day assessment and you can see if a person is in parasympathetic or sympathetic tone. Um, and you can actually, and because they're tracking what they do during those three days, you see a timestamp of when things are happening. And it, you know, it's not a perfect test because you have to go over it in retrospect, but I have found that everybody's source of stress is unique. And this is where we get back into personalized medicine. Um, there are people who go to work and they're in flow state. And then they go home and it's just, it's a disaster zone. And there's people whose home life is literally their, their like wonderful place where they, their their sanctuary and life is good. And then they get to work and they've got a bad relationship with their boss or they've got problems with their um, coworkers and it's just bad and they're not getting any recovery. And and this is really important too, is thinking about the, the, the fact that we actually don't want to live without stress. We need stress to thrive. We just need enough stress. We don't need, and we need to have um, the right opinion of stress too. So having the opinion that your life is stressful and that you are stressed out is actually probably more damaging than people realize because that's, that you're actually adding a level of psychological stress on top of the objective experience you're having in, re- in reality. Um, so you're basically doubling your stress. And so that's, that's where this great book by Kelly, I think, no, that's the willpower matrix. There's a, there's a book on they call the upside of stress, I believe. And it's really just all about this, that mm-hmm. we want to get to a certain state of stress that, that keeps us moving and going, but not so much that we're burning out and breaking down. Well, I think uh, Hans Selye, who really defined a lot of this early work, defined it well with you stress and de-stress. Yep, exactly. And that uh, basically every adaptive system, you have to stress its adaptive capacity for it to continue to grow adaptive capacity. That means you have mm-hmm. to you know, bring your cardiovascular system to its max. If you want to get better cardiovascular health, you have to bring a muscle to its max. You have to stretch to the limit of stretching if you want to get more flexible. Mm -hmm. Right. Same with hot and cold, the same with, you know, so many things. But then you need a certain amount of that and then you need repair time. Exactly. And the amount that you can tolerate is unique to you. Mm -hmm. So the catecholamethyl transferase gene becomes very important here because to me, it's it's a pretty good marker of how much stress a person can tolerate before they break down. And what I typically see is the warriors, I see them all the time in entrepreneurship and investing. And the warriors are a lot of times the, the people who are the worker bees at the company who just keep their head down and do the work. And they like to have a stable, consistent environment. But it's so funny that like you see, you, you can, st- not that it's that simplified, but it is one of the, one of the many tools you can use to start really identifying like, where can a person really meet their, their limit? And how? And, and my interest is also like, how do you optimize to that point, right? Like I'm in the middle. I'm like warrior slash warrior. So 
I can have, handle a pretty good amount of stress and I really do need a good amount of stress to function at my best. But once I hit that breaking point, I just fall apart. And so I have to really train myself to give myself recovery. Um, and I was telling you earlier, like I spent three days without my computer in Illinois with my family. Mm-hmm. And I have, I'm very, very, very lucky. I have a great relationship with my family. My, my sisters are amazing. We all just thrive and get along together when we're together. And oh my God, like I went from having like about a nine out of 10 feeling of overwhelm on Friday to like two to three today. And literally it was just three days of quality time with my loved ones. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I think that it's, it's very, very underutilized. Um, this, this quality time with our community and our family and friends, like chronic loneliness is a huge source of stress in the American in culture. And it's really bad for our immune systems. Yeah, I think uh, this is one of the most interesting things that the study of blue zones tells us. Yep, absolutely. That uh, the societies that live over 100 um, the most, there are a number of correlations with diet and lifestyle, but one of the highest correlations is uh, high-quality social connections. Absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, like it's part of Maslow's hierarchy. We always get back to that, that hierarchy, but like, you know, the problem is, is a lot of people's baseline physiology is not being met. And so if you're searching for food and you're searching for safety and you don't have, I'm sorry, someone is like knocking above me. (laughs) Um, if you're searching for food and safety, you know, love and community are kind of above that. And that that's where, um, you know, like the, the, the possibility of like living in more, tribal communities is probably best for humanity too. Um, having more tight knit communities where everyone helps support each other is really, really key. Um, I have a a friend who had an interesting thing to say about Maslow's hierarchy, which is, you know, we think about, uh, safety and security at the bottom of the stack and then belonging next. But his comment was that that was a perspective that we created in the developed world where you could have safety and security as an individual because of police force and military force and the ability to go buy most of the things you needed. But for the entire evolutionary history of humans until recently, if you weren't, if you didn't belong to a tribe, you were definitely dead. And so that there was no such thing as safety and security outside of belonging. So he was arguing that you actually flip putting belonging at the bottom of the stack. Mm, And I think it's an interesting perspective. Yeah. I think you're right. I mean, I think that Maslow's hierarchy is really just a nice framework and map to think about what human needs and wants are. Mm-hmm. Um, the human needs are in particular. Um, as a, you know, as a person who works in, you know, I, I have a comfortable living in San Francisco. It's a very expensive city to live in. Like I realized like more and more though, that um, just by looking at people on the street, looking at people who are homeless, um, we have those of us who have com- comfortable lives like we have absolutely no idea what it's like to be really struggling and what it means to be living, um, day to day, paycheck to paycheck. And it's, it's gotta be an unbelievable stressor for a lot of people. And I don't, I, I really do think that like, maybe we're getting a little bit too into politics now, but I do think that if we had, um, better access to healthcare and, and a basic income, we'd see the health of the country dramatically improve just by this, just by giving people the ability to feed themselves and the ability to house themselves, you know? Yeah, clearly. Okay. So I wanted to go back um, and I know we have to wrap up soon, but just a a couple quick things. You mentioned the COMT gene and mutations there and the warrior and warrior um, Mm -hmm. mutation types. And I don't know that that's something everyone's familiar with. And so specifically, uh, why would someone's stress capacity correspond to mutations on this gene? Um, I mean, this is kind of like a, a, a long, long discussion if we're going to get into nutrigenomics, but basically it's, it's a dopamine metabolism gene, um, catecholamethyltransferase. So um, if you, I mean, I, do you, I mean, if people really want to get into this, I recommend reading up um, on like mkhfr.net mm-hmm. or whatnot. But the fundamental point is that some people thrive with more or less um, dopamine around. And for some people, they need more stimulus. They need more, um, they need a little bit more stress. They need, they need to be going after something. 
in order for their, in order for them to feel like they're literally at their best. Um, which is why you see this. I think you see a lot of warriors who are entrepreneurs because they, they function best when they have more dopamine around and they get more dopamine around when they're under stress. So they need a bit more stress than the average person to be at their best. Um, on the other hand, some people who, um, when, when you put them under stress and, and they have more dopamine around, they feel overwhelmed by that. They subjectively, they, they feel like it's too much and they can't function because it's causing them to, um, to feel overstimulated. So that's, that's the simplest way I describe it. But one of the things we haven't really talked a little bit about um, that I think people should probably know if we're going to get into this overlap between nutrition and stress is... Um, this Dr. Um, Gonzalez, who wrote Nutrition in the Autonomic Nervous System, it's basically like a compendium of a bunch of other doctors who came before him and dentists who, there, there's been a few really big leaders in this space, like Weston Price and Dr. Kelly, um, who basically were dentists who realized that different people needed different diets to survive and to thrive. And what he found was, is, and Dr. Gonzalez kind of picked up where they left off, um, was that people were more likely to develop cancerous tumors when they weren't being fed the right food for their metabolism. And when they f corrected their metabolism um, by feeding them the right fuel and, re and giving them the right nutrients, they were finding that they, were, they had a much, much better response to their therapies. Um, I'm of the school of thought that we should use both modern medicine and nutritional medicine together to fight cancer. And I think that there's an exciting um, possibility that we'll be able to figure out using continuous heart rate variability and continuous glucose monitoring, what is the right amount of macronutrients and uh, the right amount of macronutrients for a person's best uh, metabolic profile. And so basically what Dr. Kelly discovered was that certain people were really, would really respond to the vegan, vegetarian and diet profile um, where they were eating large quantities of raw plant-based diets. Mm -hmm. He himself fought his own malignant cancer this way. And um, doctors basically told him he was going to die. And he's like, well, I have a bunch of orphan children that I take care of, so I'm going to have to not die. And he started treating himself with nutrition and found that his tumors were shrinking when he fed his body what it needed. And But then there was women that there would be people who came along to him who would give them the same diet and they wouldn't respond. So he gave them the opposite. He gave them more animal, um, animal fats and cooked vegetables and root vegetables. And he found that they were responding to that. And he was like, whoa, okay. So now he developed like a series of like questionnaires that would basically help you profile the right nutrition for your metabolism. But I've done these questionnaires and they're, they take like, like three or four hours of your day to do. So where I think we're heading is actually both questionnaires combined with laboratory testing, combined with glucose monitoring and wearable monitoring to figure out what is the right diet for your nervous system and for your metabolism. And, you know, I think, I think it's super complex and I, I think we have a lot, a lot of research that should go into this, but, um, it seems like we're kind of heading in, the, in a really cool direction with all this. I mean, everybody who I, I talk to a lot of people who've beaten cancer with both medicine and nutrition, and you often find people who've gone the ketogenic route and they've like mastered their, you know, um, glioblastoma, or you find people who've gone the, the, um, what is it? The Gerson protocol route, which is the vegan route, right? The super high plant-based route. And you're, and what I think is fascinating is like people are responding to both mm -hmm. and maybe we'll be able to like really, really, maybe we'll be able to use software in the next few years that can do this better. So practical side, um, if, if there are people who are listening to this, who are interested in starting to find out what the right, uh, nutrition is for them for optimizing mm -hmm. health, preventing disease. What are some basic ways they can get started? Sure. Um, the, the first thing that I want, to, I, I would recommend is, is as obviously like your basic labs. So um, let me see what I sent my sister. Really, I actually just like my sister. Um, I probably shouldn't be mentioning family online, but like you know. She's like, my, my, my hair is like thinner than I'd like. How can I make my hair grow faster? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So what I want to know if I, for example, somebody, somebody's hair is too thin. And it's, it's, to me, if someone's hair is too thin, it's like looking at a plant whose leaves are like shriveling. Like there's something missing from that person's body that, they're, that they need to get. So in women, typically I see, pro, like they don't, typically you don't see enough protein. 
So I would do a NutriVal test or an easier test for that would be like an albumin. Um, you can kind of get an assessment of a person's protein needs through some of their basic labs. Um, I'd also want to look at their lab, their, their lipid panel, right? So, you know, you don't want too low of lipids and you don't want too high of lipids. You want just right. So I would look at their lipid panels. I would see what they're eating. I would see where they're getting their fats. I would see what their, their genetics look like. Looking at their ApoE4 gene, that's really key for looking at lipids. Um, I like to get an NMR lipo a protein analysis to look at the type of LDL, just because um, you can have normal LDL, but you can have a lot of the bad. And you can have, um, one of the things that I'm, I'm also digging into is like, I have really high HDL and there's po it's possible that that's not even that healthy. Um, you, you really don't want too high or too low of anything. You want just right. So I would look at the lipid panel. I would always look at vitamin D. I mean, everyone should be doing this more than once a year. Please do your vitamin D levels a few times a year because it's really the simplest biohack. I mean, Dave Asprey was say, has been saying this for years, but like everyone knows this is true. This is really, really a simple way to biohack your, your metabolism, your hormones, your immunity, your bone health. Um, making sure you, you replete your vitamin D with vitamin K. Um, I would also look at your RBC magnesium to see if you need to, you, you need to uh, improve that. I would look at your, um, your typical chemistry panel. I would look at your CBC and manual differential to get an idea um, of your immune system function. These are just really simple. Things like ferritin. A lot of women are anemic and don't know it because the doctors aren't always checking. So I like to look at ferritin levels. Um, and then omega-3s, almost everybody's deficient in omega-3s. So um, upping the fish or supplementing with a really good quality fish oil is really, really important. Um, DHEA is another good one that I like to look at. Um, and then I like to, I like to see um, a microbiome test. So you can look at like a, a Genova GIFX and you can see if a person is, has any malabsorption. You can see if they have, um, if they need more enzymes, a lot of people need more digestive enzymes because they're not eating foods that have naturally occurring enzymes in them and their, and their bodies are not making up for the difference. A lot of people's digestion is just super taxed by the amount of work that they have to do on a regular basis to, di to, to like really process the food that's foods that they're eating. And you can see if a person needs more diversity. Like for example, I um, have low lactobacillus almost always on all my, on every single microbiome test I've ever done. So what am I doing? I'm literally lacto fermenting everything now. So I'm getting lacto fermented foods into my bodies to replete that missing lactobacillus. Um, you can do the same thing with bifidobacter. You can look at the food, um, FUT2 gene to understand bifidobacter metabolism. Um, and you can also see if you've got overgrowth, um, or you have, um, so some people have too many bacteria growing in their gut. And some people have too little. So those are, those are some simple ways of optimizing your nutrition. And at the end of the day, like most people um, need more plant-based antioxidants. And you can see that on a NutriVal. So you can see if a person is getting enough um, plant-based antioxidants. And you can see if they um, are getting enough protein. So you can see if there's any amino acid um, problems. Okay, so you just mentioned a number of baseline labs <laughs> that you like to look yeah. at that may or yeah. may not be familiar to the people who are listening, and they yeah. can on their own. So the one thing that you're saying is go find a functional medicine doctor who specializes in personalized sure. precision medicine and get foundational labs done and work with someone who can actually really help you. And, and, and you know what? What's really cool is that like there's even a movement in the, I'd say, affordable world of this company called Precision Nutrition. I've always really admired this company because they seem to have a really solid approach to nutrition. And they're starting to partner with a lot of, um, of these, these personalized nutrition companies and developing far reduced cost um, access to some of these labs. So, mm -hmm. you know, even if you can't afford to work with a full-blown functional medicine doctor, um, there's so many different tiers of what you can do and where you can spend your money. And so Finding a good precision nutrition coach, um, you know, most people would benefit from just really working with the coach to increase their vegetable intake. Like the walls protocol to me, yeah. you know, whether you eat meat or not, everybody should be aiming to eat more fruits and vegetables every day. So I heard um, you, I heard you just, say yeah. a number of things that independent of testing sound like they're generally recommended, which was omega-3. Vitamin Omega D, three, vitamin D, magnesium, vitamin K, magnesium, probiotics, mm -hmm. yep. exercise, enzymes, exercise, sleep. exercise is really, really key. Sleep is, I mean, sleep is like a, 
I, I know you sp- you've spoken to Dan Party a bunch about sleep, but like listen to those two podcasts because sleep. If your sleep is not good, then everything's going to be harder. Exercise is going to be harder. Nutrition, willpower, like everything. Mm-hmm. So you have to get your sleep right if you want to get your behaviors better. And that's something that I learned in medical school. I started working with a sleep doctor um, as I was doing sleep sleep research. And so I really prioritized sleep um, when I started learning about it and educate, educating myself on it. And I sleep like pretty impeccably well. Um, I dream every night and I remember my dreams and I, I feel like I have like a really healthy relationship with sleep. And to me, um, that has not always been the case. And if I didn't sleep the way that I did, I would burn out a lot more often. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, it's hard to say that anything is more important than exercise or more important than nutrition or more important than stress management. But if I had to, I would say sleep is more important. Um, yeah, it's just so fundamental to, to the rhythm of life, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious if there are people who are in the Bay Area, not that far away, and they're wanting to um, run their labs and get a personalized program together. Are you still seeing anybody? I do still see patients. Um, I, I have a very small panel and it's very, very personalized, very bespoke. Um, and you know, it's, it's not, it's not inexpensive, but it's because I, I'm like, you know, it's like, it's like detailing cars, you know, like you can go to, uh, out of the box doctor's office and get a really good assessment from a lot of good doctors. But like, I'm just taking it a step above and I'm also just doing a lot of things myself for people. So, um, I, I think it's really, it's not for everybody, but if you want, I mean, I'm really, I'm not trying to like downplay my practice because I just, there is a certain sense of guilt that I have that I do charge so much, but part of the reason why I'm working with Sano Intelligence and developing this continuous glucose monitor for the masses, which we haven't really talked about, but I'm not trying to shamelessly plug this company because they're not even out yet. They're not even going to be available for like a year, but, um, there's a wearable patch that we're working on. That's a continuous glucose monitor. That's going to be a 24 hour wear and direct to consumer. No, no prescription necessary. Like I'm really, really working hard to develop technology that can be scalable because I want people to have access to the, the simple, um, the simple tools that I think are the most useful in my practice. And, and um, I also am a big fan of parsley health. My friend Robin Burzen is an amazing doctor um, huge fan of Stephanie Daniels. She's also a great functional medicine doctor. Um, and so there, there are really great, there's a huge range of possibility of what you can afford that's out there. And, um, if you listen to the basics of the things that I've told you today, you'll be well, 50% of the way there. The problem is, is that like most people aren't even doing the basics. And if you're not doing the simple, simple things that you need to optimize your health, then it's like, you're taking a dirty car to get detailed without cleaning it. You know, (laughs) it's like clean off the windshield first, you know, it's not even going to, it's not going to make a difference if you don't clean off the windshield and keep yourself, um, and like fill up the gas tank, you know? So I want to restate something that you said here, which is, uh, with regard to the cost of doing, um, very personalized functional medicine, precision medicine, concierge Mm -hmm. medicine, um, you know, for, for those listening, most of the doctors that we've had on this podcast, uh, Dr. Stickler, Dr. Sanderson, you know, and um, now with Molly, are they're all people who have pretty small concierge medicine practices, and that's why they actually have cutting edge insights because they're able to run a lot of labs with people, do cutting edge therapies, research the cases individually, then run the labs again, watch what changes. Mm-hmm. And for most things. This is not necessary, but either for severe illness where we're trying to overcome complex right. illness or for mm-hmm. really elite optimization, it makes a huge difference. And right. we have to get to uh, economics that allow this to be the future of medicine for everyone. But like I, one thing I just kind of want people to know is the doctors who are working in this space are not working in the most profitable space they could be working in. The the That's raw true. cost on the labs is stupid expensive, as is the amount of time that it takes to actually research a case. Like if you're putting together, trying to make sense of hundreds or maybe thousands of biomarkers, mm-hmm. the doctor's spending a lot of time and then a lot of training time that's non-paid to be able to do it. And they yep. could just be doing aesthetic medicine and making so much more money. Um, and so 
It just mm-hmm. happens to be like the only way the cost structure works. But what they're doing on the cutting edge is showing that what we thought was incurable is not actually incurable. What we thought the peak of health was isn't the peak of health. And then we get to see how do we bring that to economies of scale, which is you know part of the work we're all working on together. Right. Yeah. I mean, like... I think that there's there are some people that are trying to do this at scale. Um, one of my friends, James Maskell, he's been trying to um, introduce me to his company for a while called I think it's called EvoMed um, yeah. or New Yeah. So they're they're really trying to make functional medicine more scalable for everyone. Um, I think it's going to get there. If you're lucky, you can get some of the stuff paid for by your insurance. If you've already met your deductible, like I had, I have a friend in Chicago or New York who. Um, found a functional doctor that takes her insurance. Mm -hmm. So like the key is really just working hard to understand your benefits. And like I use a health savings account for even my own health because I don't need the doctor that much. But when I do, I like what I spend my money on to be tax free. So, you know, I did like Rolfing last year and it was, it was tax free. And I I did like 10, a 10 series of Rolfing for, um, which is a type of massage that for me, massage is one of the best like it's one of the best ways to spend your your healthcare dollars because it's such an important way to reduce stress. So, I I think there's a lot of ways that you can go about finding affordable access to this stuff. Um, there's also like direct labs online. There's like ways that you can even just order labs directly. They're they're going to be more expensive because the company online that's ordering labs for you is taking the cut. Um, in my practice, I don't, I don't actually upsell labs. I just charge on top of everything. I charge like a flat fee, um, and then I charge. Like, like a, a retainer. And then some people just want to be, do my hourly, but what they don't realize is that the hourly is actually more expensive than the retainer. So <laughs> it's a, whatever people's preferences, which is so funny, but like, um, I split my time in between my practice and working with tech companies. So, um, that's part of the reason why I also charge a lot because like every person is like a mini com- company in themselves and that, that I have so much work to do for each individual. But it is really gratifying, and I've seen some pretty remarkable things in some people's health. Um, I've seen some people's really life, their life change, and that that's that's pretty awesome. So, um, you so know, it, but it isn't for everyone. You know, not you, you have to really be willing to do the work, and not everybody's willing to do the work. Some of the clients that I've worked with, like we've had, I've had to find them other doctors because they just didn't want to put the work in. They wanted it done for them. And health optimization is not this thing that I do for you. It's a thing that I do with you. Mm-hmm. So. If someone does want to um, find out more and reach out, what's the best contact for you? Um, my website is one way to find me, D-R-M-O-L-L-Y dot C-O. You can also text me on Twitter at Molly Maloof, MD. You can find me on Instagram, which I'm fairly active on Instagram stories at D-R-M-O-L-L-Y dot C-O, Dr. Molly dot co. Same thing as my website. Um, you can even find me on LinkedIn, which is where if you're like a professional and you want to see my background, you can find me there. Um, and then you can always email me, uh, through one of those, one of those ways. Um, yeah. Great. So and I then, guess, you know, we should probably do an, we should probably do like a sequel to this. Cause we didn't even get into like the weird hype uh, for technological San Francisco, Silicon Valley nonsense. No, I was about to say, just continuous glucose monitoring and then a little bit on lifestyle and heart rate variability and stress you know, took the time that we have and it really deserves that. Um, And there's more that we could do just on these topics, but one on genetics, personalized medicine, and then um, kind of future biotech uh, longevity extension. I I would love to have you back on the show and and have a sequel. Um, For just a couple more resources for people right now, if someone's wanting to do heart rate variability monitoring, is there a device that you recommend? Oh my God, yes. So this company literally just came out with um, their product available to consumers. It's called Leaf Therapeutics, L-I-E-F mm-hmm. Therapeutics. And I am obsessed with this, this company because they've created a patch that you can attach to your um, chest. And it's kind of like a wearable stress test that you, can, you don't have to use it forever. But what it does is it measures your heart rate variability. It also senses your breathing and... When, when it notices that your heart rate variability is declining, it will send you haptic feedback and teach you how to breathe deeply using the haptic feedback. So it's great for self-regulation, for anxiety, for lowering um, blood pressure. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, I'm super, super big fan of this company because 
And I'm actually not affiliated with them, even though I probably would love to be <laughs> because they are so, I've just, been, once I found out about this, I was like, great. Like now we have a tool that, that I don't have to prescribe that doesn't, that that's in real time, that I don't have to spend three days waiting for them to give me the, the attachment back to get the data. And, um, it says pre-order on the website, but I do think that they should be, they sh you should, yeah, you can pre-order it right now. So this should be available very soon. There's actually going to be a, uh, I was just interviewed for the today show on, on heart rate variability monitoring. And, um, so that will be airing April 9th at like 8am or 9am in the morning, 8am no, in the morning, um, a big segment on technology for stress. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is my favorite tool. And then a lot of people, I don't have this tool yet, but a lot of people love the oral ring mm -hmm. i hear that from everybody um i don't have it yet but I, I really should probably try it and then um first beat is a tool that you might be able to find um so that's that's pretty rad and then another thing that i wanted to plug is is um a lot of people keep on asking me about like more consumer oriented tools for tracking metrics on health and there's two companies that are getting a lot of attention one of them is dexafit and the other one is go forward. And both of these companies are providing you with um, one thing we didn't talk about today, which is monitoring like sort of bigger metrics on your health, like VO2 max, um, resting metabolic rate, um, you know, these, these, these things that are actually pretty important markers for, for optimizing health. And so mm -hmm. Dexafit's pretty cool. I'm going to go try them tomorrow. So I'll let you guys know on our next podcast, what I think of their experience, but I'm a big fan of anything that can provide um, the ability to like find these 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 metrics over time. So it's pretty cool. Awesome. And then with regard to the continuous glucose monitoring, Sano, I know you work with them, and you said they're about a year away from coming out with a next gen tech. Is there mm -hmm. any tech that people can currently get that is uh, meaningful for glucose for glucose monitoring? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the so Abbott is my favorite company for glucose monitoring. Um, their, their spot check monitor that you can buy the, what is it called? The Abbott, not, not the, not the Libre, but the Abbott sent the, like, what is it called? <laughs> well, basically the, um, Abbott freestyle Libre is the continuous monitor, but then Abbott also makes a, a spot check monitor for, for like blood testing off of a finger prick. Mm -hmm. Um, both of these are really good tools and so I like the, the spot check monitor for the, um, for, for more accuracy because it has to, it has about a 5% inaccuracy, um, measured by this thing called MARD and the Abbott Libre Pro, which you wear on your body, which is a continuous monitor has about a 10 to 15% inaccuracy. So it's not perfect, but it's better for trends, mm -hmm. but for, but for spot checks and for like, if you see something abnormal on your blood sugar, on your wearable, if you really want to verify that it's abnormal, you'll do the finger prick. And like, if you were a diabetic, you should not be um, using the CGM necessarily to dose your insulin. You should be using the, the finger prick. Um, but for trends, I like the continuous monitoring for spot testing. I like the, the finger pricks tools. Um, you can also go to your doctor and do labs um, such as an AM fasting glucose and AM fasting insulin, uh, homo IR, which is a marker of insulin resistance, which you can actually get from your, just a calculation of your fasting insulin and fasting glucose. You can do your hemoglobin A1C. You can do your, um, fructosamine. And, um, those are, those are pretty good starting points for, um, for glucose metabolism. Molly, it was a delight to have you on the show. I think this was a good introduction to, um, people understanding why blood sugar is a meaningful topic beyond just thinking about type 2 diabetes and why um, continuous monitoring is interesting and a bunch of other things. And I would love to have you back and go deeper into more topics. Awesome. This was super fun. Thank you so much. All right. More soon. Thanks all. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Collective Insights. For the full show notes on this episode and for more great interviews, visit us at neurohacker.com slash collective insights. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Want to learn a better strategy for mental well-being? We designed a beautifully illustrated 32-page guide integrating care for your mind, brain, body, and environment into a balanced approach for a better life. Download the foundational guide to neurohacking at neurohacker.com backslash guide.